Thank you, thank you. I should go, we made it. <laughs> so welcome to our first inaugural live arts festival this year lovingly called the Worlds of Oliver Sacks. The past five days have been truly, and here I get to fill in the blanks. Maybe you can help me. Thought provoking, surprising, provocative, funny, touching, loving, and yes, questioning. We've been able to welcome more than 3,000 people here this week, and a 100 different scholars, artists, writers, thinkers. The house has been really buzzing with what I like to call the participation in the world of ideas, which is what this place is about. Tonight's events, like several others in the festival, is being live streamed via our website at newyorkliveartsorg slash Live ideas, I'm hardly computer literate, so all this language is pretty alien to me, but please check out our website because there'll be other things available uh, from the festival if you've not been able to see them. I wanna thank again the Ford Foundation for being so generous. I wanna thank my staff here, our staff here, from the administration to the technical. Big round of applause for the technical. <laughs> And yes, our public relations department, all those people that make it a pleasure to come in and out of the building and get you here in the seats. And yes, we'd like to thank Lawrence Weschler, who is the one that really made this, all, this whole thing a reality and introduced us to the incomparable Dr. Sachs. I'd also like to thank uh, Kate Edgar and Haley Wojcik. And so, without further ado, let me welcome our moderator tonight, who is Robert Krolwich. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this is gonna be uh, just a short preamble before I bring Oliver out. I, I, for New Yorkers will appreciate this. Oliver lives in an apartment building, which is exactly one cabana, is that the word, with the thing that's outside those Park Avenue buildings, although he doesn't live on Park Avenue? One of those awnings. <laughs> he wakes up in the morning, he goes downstairs, he walks one awning over, and he goes upstairs to the third floor, and that's his office. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very nice arrangement if you can get it. In that office is Kate Edgar, his assistant, and Haley Wolschuk, who um, is his receptionist, also a musician. So I said to her, uh, since we're gonna be going back to 1933 and sort of doing Oliver from the get-go, <laughs> and the Oliver you're gonna meet in this particular conversation is probably not the one you can really find in the books too much. It's, it's the sort of the, the under Oliver. So everything you thought you knew about him, you're gonna have to erase slightly, which brings up the question of erasure, which brings up Haley's song. Haley's a musician when she's not receptioningly handling Oliver's stuff, and uh, she's a good one, and she happens to have written a song about Actually, here's the, um, I want to black out with you. Won't you black out with me? I want to black out with you. Let's go back to how it used to be. It's a sort of an amnesia song. So I thought we'd just open with that, erase, and then we'd start. So Haley, wherever you may be, come on in. And uh, she has a guitar. Here she is. And I'll be right back. Thanks, Robert. All right, I'm gonna um, ask you all to sing along at the uh, chorus after you've heard it once, um, which is the part up there that now you have no excuse not to sing since the lyrics are being projected. Cinder block, a bag of batteries. Oh, baby, please, let's catch amnesia together. I don't want to remember. It'll just hurt for a minute. It's easy once you begin it. I walk into a wall. You follow me, slip and fall. We'll forget it all. Let's forget it all. Let's get it over 
the head Just not so hard that we're dead But so hard we forget all the things that we said Oh, oh. let's get hit over the head Just not so hard that we're dead But so hard we forget all the things that we said And the things we haven't said yet Let's get obliterated till we feel sedated so we can recreate it all. Let's fall, let's somersault down the stairs to say who's fall, who cares? Let's tip back our chairs and butt heads with a bowling ball. Hit the reset button. Let's shake the edges, sketch. Let's clean up this mess we're in. And should our plans fail? Should the effects pale? We can always catch amnesia again. We can always catch amnesia again. We can always catch amnesia. Let's get it over the head. Not so hard that we're dead, but so hard we forget all the things that we said. Oh, let's get it over the head. Just not so hard that we're dead, but so hard we forget all the things that we said and the things we haven't said yet. Thank you, Haley. This is Oliver. We will make our way. This is for you. Just take it down. And we'll have to test out the sound here to make sure Oliver can hear me clearly. Can you so far? Can you hear me? Sorry. Right. Um, I'm going to have a little few slides to show. So uh, can we bring a little Oliver in? Just uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> you are a cutie. I'll give you that. Uh, let's take a look at the family. Okay. So which one are you in this uh, uh, configuration? I, I'm the one with the mustache. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I'm guessing that you're in between your mother. Are you at the top? No, I'm in my mother's arms. Oh, that's you there. All right. Huh. Um, your mother was part of a really big family, right? How many brothers and sisters, half brothers, whatever? Uh, she was the 16th of 18. Whoa. And it's an enormous, I mean, if you add up the cousins and then their children, which would be your first cousins once removed, you've got like what, like 60, 70, 80 people that are cousiny? Uh, at least. Yeah. They include Al Cap, oddly enough, of Little Abner and Daisy May. Anybody else I've heard of? I don't know. Maybe Abba Iban? Abba Iban is, really? <laughs> Let me just make sure. 
Ava, even an Al Cap, I, that's a, a connection I would never have. Um, oh. Though actually, they're both on my father's side. On your father, oh, okay. So that doesn't include, all right, so um, actually, Ava Eben, I, I, somebody told me once that you and Ava Eben were at some affair, and you both went to get salad at the salad, and he looked at you walking and said, you rem do you remember it? Is um, yes, well, we'd. Um, I'd hardly seen him when he was in office, but uh, um, after that, we really the first time I met him, we'd both been invited to lunch by a second cousin, in fact, by the Caps. And um, we were seated at opposite was Al ends. Cap, was that, was that their original name, Cap? Um, no, it was Kaplan. Ah, okay. Ah. Um, and um, uh, Aub Abba, Aubrey and I were different ends of the table, but we converged and almost collided on a beetroot salad, which, which, which no one else would touch. <laughs> and later we got into conversation and found ourselves finishing each other's sentences and having rather similar gestures. And I said to him, um, you seem more similar to me in some ways than my three brothers. And he said, he felt the same with regard to his three siblings. And I said, how can this be so? And he said, atavism. And I, I looked, he said, atavis, a grandfather. His own father had died when he was very young and he was really brought up by his grandfather, um, who was, um, whose Hebrew name was Eliyahu Zaev. His Yiddish name was Eli Velva and his English name was Oliver Wolf. Uh, so, really? And he said... What are your um, first two names? Uh, well, I, I would again be, strictly speaking, as uh, 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 Eliyahu is Ave. I so you're an Oliver a, Wolf too. I'm an Oliver Wolf too. And I have lots of cousins who are Elliot and a few who are Wolf. Anyhow, um, he said that people commented on the uncanny similarity between the old man and the boy. He said there was no one else in his grandfather's generation like this, no one in the parental generation, and he thought no one in his generation until I came through the door and he thought it was his grandfather come to life. Wow. Al Cap, I assume, had a very different gait, but chose, didn't like beet salads. I'm just going to assume. Uh, he wasn't at that particular meal. I uh, assume so not, no. All right. Your house, uh, let's take a look at the house. Um, this is uh, 37 Mapesbury Road. Um, were you living in this house during World War II for part of it, or when the, when the bombs came? Um, no, I, I was evacuated like millions of other kids in 39, uh, although until 43, although I did spend part of 1940 in London when the Blitz was dying down. And did you ever see a bomb, did a bomb ever land in your neighborhood? Um, Yes, on um, uh, a bomb landed, a very large bomb called a landmine, landed next door, but didn't explode. But the whole street was evacuated. And, and I remember I was just six at the time, and, and um, we all walked along in darkness with red shaded flashlights. Um, I thought I had a memory of incendiary bombs landing in our garden, and of my father trying to put them out with water, uh, my brothers bringing him pails of water, but the water somehow making the fire worse. And, but, and I wrote about this in Uncle Tungsten, but when I checked it with my brother Michael, he said, uh, you never saw it, you weren't there. I said, what do you mean, I, I can see it in my mind now? And he said, maybe, but he said, this is because our elder brother, David, wrote a very vivid account. Ah. And he said, you were enthralled by it, and apparently not only enthralled, but I recreated it in my mind and then appropriated it. Of course. <laughs> so it's so, um, and, and a lot of memories can be that like that. They're not primary experience. They're something you've heard or dreamt or read, but you may think they are your own, and this can give a danger of sort of pseudo-plagiarism and things like that. So while you weren't here, you were at, you were having a horror of your own with your brother Michael. 
you were sent off to a school which was run by some really horrible man and his really horrible wife. And it was a really horrible war for you. Uh, just in briefly, what was, going, what was wrong with this place? Um, well, um, I, he hadn't been a horrible man before the war. He was regarded as a rather kindly man. But I, I, I think the pressures of war and being forced into a headmastership had some effect on him. And um, uh, corporal punishment, so-called, is um, you know has a long and honourable, possibly a long and dishonourable <laughs> tradition in England. And uh, I, um, I and others were were beaten almost every day. Uh, on one occasion, he broke a cane on my eight-year-old buttocks, and then I think wanted to charge my parents for that. Really? That's like Chinese shooting you and charging you for the bullet kind of thing. <laughs> uh, right. uh, so you come back from that place, you and Michael. M Michael is kind of broken by this experience, apparently. It's, it's very, very bad for him. Um, yeah, well, he went on to, um, I came back in 43. He went on to another boarding school where he was unmercifully bullied, or perhaps attracted bullying and he broke down into an acute schizophrenic psychosis. He was 16 then, I was 11, and um, I was terrified of him and for him, and also for myself, because I thought, is this gonna happen to me? Uh, when I got back from evacuation, I had a passion for chemistry, and my parents allowed me to create a little laboratory in the house, and I, I buried myself in chemistry and experiments, partly to shut out the screams of my hallucinating brother. The, the people who rescued you at that time, I'm just gonna listen, just as from just reading, reading into you, Uncle Abe, Sid Karp, and you have an aunt. So let's do, let's do them in, um, in order. Abe, he was not an Al Cap or an Abba Ibn type. No, no. It's on the other would, side of the family. Yeah, no, on, on my mother's side, the nine sons all got into physical sciences of one sort and another, physics, chemistry, geology, metallurgy, whatever. And uh, he, he, he was in physics. Now, he was, he, a, he, was, he, was, he was more of a, he wasn't a professor or a diplomat or a doctor. Uh, or um, no, no he, was, um, he was primarily an inventor. And on the side, he was one of the co-inventors of Marmite. I don't, um, which? Um, Marmite. Marmite, which is one of my least favorite foods. <laughs> I see, and uh, why did everybody, is there a joke I'm out of here? Was there a previous section on Marmite, or no? All right, uh, he, uh, you have written here, he introduced you at age 10 to the periodic table, and for the next two years, you, uh, you just kind of got very, very, very into the elements. And Dick Lindenbaum, one of your friends at the time, wrote, he had this spectacular laboratory, this means you, in which he could do morbid things like spilling enormous quantities of sodium all over the floor. Were you an accident-prone baby chemist? Um, well, some of it was deliberate, but... Uh, <laughs> I, th there were, of course, accidents, and especially when things burst into flame, I would run outside and throw them on the lawn. <laughs> and uh, the when lawn had all... When things burst into flame, was this a, a not uncommon occurrence? Uh, well, not that uncommon. <laughs> and, and the lawn had already been damaged by, by incendiary bombs. And I finished it off, yes. I <laughs> uh, Sid Carp. Well, first of all, let's go, there's a fern garden in the back. The ant, the, 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 this is where you begin to like things that are constant. I mean, elements, after all, are fundamental and don't change. But what about cycads and ferns and things? Like, what, where does that passion come? Um, well, my mother and one of her sisters were both botanically inclined. We didn't have that many flowers in the garden, but we had a great many ferns, and I would often be taken along to the wonderful botanic gardens, Kew Gardens, and um, I, um, I, ferns and cycads have been around for three, four hundred million years, and they are very stable, and they endure 
and, and that. Uh, and they're not flashy like flowers. Uh, and also they, they, they keep their sex organs discreetly <laughs> hidden, um, uh, well, which is why they're called cryptogams. Um, and um, so, and, and, and the love for these has lasted. And as um, I'm, uh, I'm a very, I've gone once a month to every meeting of the American Fern Society. And this comes from, is this also part of not hearing Michael screaming upstairs, is that you are looking for things that won't break, won't, whether stubbornly just go on and on and on? Um, probably this too, although I, it, it does go earlier as well. Hmm. I, I mean, I, my, some of my earliest pre-war memories are of the garden and gardens. Now, Sid Casp is the biology teacher that seems to have really changed your life. Uh, um, well, um, in what you read, I reversed his name. In, in fact, he is Sid Pask. Really? Yes. Why did you do Because you were worried that you would get sued or something? Um, I'm not sure, but I, I, I felt there should be a, a little camouflage. Really? That's like calling Barack Obama well, whoever was ever the opposite of Obama. No. <laughs> um, I, um, I mean, I, I did something in, in one of my books, A Leg to Stand On, where the, uh, the surgeon was called Edgar, but there's a shop in London called Swan and Edgar, and I called him Swan. Ah, okay. Well, so, <laughs> Sid, if I may call him that correctly, well, he, you, say, you write that he was a splendid teacher. Um, oh, actually, you know who was? Actually, this is, um, yes, yeah, you. Splendid teacher, also narrow-minded, bigoted, cursed with a hideous stutter that we would imitate endlessly. Um, but he was, for you and your two best friends, he was just a, a, a change agent like very few others. Why? Um, I think because he was passionate about zoology and botany and, and organisms, and he shared his passion, and he invited us to share his passions. And he also, um, um, he donated all his time, all his weekends to, to field excursions or marine biology, and um, we, we became impassioned too. The three of you, uh, I'm now talking about Jonathan and Eric, your two best friends, they, they then form, they get, they, you label yourselves. Um, Jonathan decides that he's going to become the know-it-all about certain worms. Eric embraces sea cucumbers. W uh, what did you become? Uh, cephalopods. Cephalopods. Yes. Why did you choose cephalopods? Um, well, th they chose me. Um, no, um, well, I've, <laughs> I, 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 I've always been fascinated by the notion of of alien and an alien intelligence, and um, the the geniuses among invertebrates are, are cephalopods. They have uh, big brains and big eyes, and um, they're playful. They can be affectionate. Let me see if I understand this. The three of you are sitting around on a usual weekday afternoon, <laughs> waiting to give your hearts to someone. It's not going to be Becky or Sue Ann or whatever. It's going to be a worm, a cephalopod, and a whatever the other, a sea cucumber. Were you guys entirely normal, or <laughs> were anyone else doing this, or was this just Sid's kids? Um, um, I think probably some other kids of Sid, Sid's kids, uh, um, did this. I, I remember someone a, a year or two ahead of me um, who developed a passion for lichens. Instead, he wanted to study them as his life's work. And uh, when I met him 50 years later, he was the head of our college in Oxford and, and was the world's the greatest living authority on lichens. Um, really? I, I think we envied him. He knew what, we wa what he wanted to do. We had our passions, but we, we didn't know what the future would bring. Well, the passions took a rather odd turn. I'm going to describe uh, Jonathan Miller's account. Once, he says, we were on holiday, my parents, my sister, and myself, and we rented this house on the coast. It was summer. And we invited Oliver and Eric down. Uh, and when they arrived, they looked like something out of Waiting for Godot, kind of like Pazzo and Lucky, like a silhouetted couple. I can see them right now walking on the seawall. Oliver's wearing a bowler hat, and Eric's got these strange trousers all raised, and we're looking, well, Oliver was looking for cuttlefish, of course. Like, what, what were you doing? Um, 
Well, um, that summer we... Um, Why are we wearing a bowler hat? Uh, oh, that. Uh, well, I don't know. I probably... Uh, I, I'm really not sure. Okay. Uh, I, I can't quite reconstruct that part of the scene. What I can reconstruct is how we all went out in a fishing boat in a trawler, and the fishermen uh, sometimes got cuttlefish but threw them back in the water. And I, I said I wanted to keep them. And so they, um, and finally we had a huge tub full of cuttlefish. Live cu cuttlefish? Uh, live cuttlefish, although they weren't live by the time we got back <coughs> to the house. And indeed we um, finished them off by pickling them in alcohol. Or um, was your intention to preserve them for some future um, uh, scholarship? Um, um, for Sid, for and, Sid. And, and for the class, you know. I mean, it would be a, a, a wonderful thing for everyone to have a cuttlefish or two to dissect. <laughs> you know, you, you can't imagine the pleasure which comes from I, I can't, actually. Uh, um, <laughs> but, but then um, uh, I guess I had miscalculated the amount of alcohol which was needed, and um, three days later there were a series of, of dull thunderous noises from the basement. And we went down and there was an extraordinary scene because the bottles had fermented and exploded and there was cuttlefish on the ceiling, um, <laughs> or, or on the walls and, and everywhere. Um, um, Eric, who, um, who was always full of ideas, thought we might, be, we might be able to conceal the smell, which was inconceivable, um, <laughs> with, 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 with lavender water. <laughs> Um, Eric actually blames you and says it was essence of coconut. Do you have under um, You know, I think he may be right, yes. <laughs> I think it was a coconut, right. Um, um, uh, he, when, when his parents, came, Jonathan's parents came back that day in the afternoon. This was, the coconut was to disguise the, the smell of, of, di of dead cuttlefish. cuttlefish. Yeah. A putrefied cuttlefish. Putrefied. A f fermented cuttlefish. In their summer rental. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, but um, when Jonathan's parents arrived, they, were, they first sort of smiled as they smelled the coconut, and then they got a little f further. <laughs> and, and, um, because for some reason, the coconut and the cuttlefish had settled in, in alternating bands. <laughs> and um, uh, anyhow, um, I, I, who had instigated this, was not exactly popular with them, and there was considerable difficulty in, in um, renting the house, <laughs> subsequently. Perhaps the, uh, the, the, uh, the vacation was cut a little bit short. Yes. I, yes. He says now, in addition to uh, your love of cephalopods, he says that, uh, that, this is Jonathan now, says that it was interesting always to eat with you at the same table. I'm going to just quote his description of uh, dining with you. Yes, I, I haven't heard any of this stuff. No, you haven't. <laughs> uh, Oliver had an absolutely unremitting, unvaryingly voracious and omnivorous appetite. It wasn't that he devoured with any sort of ferocious rapidity, but that gradually you noticed that the food was gravitating towards his end of the table. And with a sort of idle endlessness, the food was simply consumed. So if you wanted to dine with him and eat anything, you had to hide stuff for yourself. Later on, when he visited my wife and I, when we got married, I, when I knew Oliver was coming, we, there was a great deal of hiding of food. <laughs> now, I was just thinking about that, and I, I ran into something else where he's commenting on your dad. This is like, this is this food in the family. He says, I don't know why this would be the case. I can always remember that your dad used to drive around with the boot of his car, his trunk, car trunk, filled with fried fish so that he'd reach in and compulsively give it to people. And so I think food was very important to the Saxes. I, I, I'm just throwing this a lot for your general comment. Yeah. What was your, did your dad actually have fried fish? Um, the, um, well, yeah, and, and when um, uh, he, he loved doing house calls, and I liked going with him, but he knew the contents of all his patients' refrigerators. And um, he, he spent most of his life weighing around 300 or so, but he, he made it to 95. But he was also um, omnivorous, compulsive, and sort of absent-minded. Uh, but, but the Saks fried fish was widely distributed. <laughs> was this just like you know, giving kibbles to dogs? Or like, is this just something doctors did? 
in the 1950s? I, I hadn't heard of any other doctor doing it. <laughs> um, no, or, 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 although perhaps at one time I thought they did. You know, when um, uh, Darwin spent eight years dissecting barnacles, yes. and um, uh, his son's schoolmates would ask, uh, he would ask his, his friends, I'm sorry, his sons would ask, his sons would ask their friends, where does your father do his barnacles? <laughs> and, and, and so it was assumed that, you know, that all fathers dissected barnacles. Maybe I assumed that all fathers sort of uh, doctors distributed fried fish. Now, uh, when, when your mother came to the dinner table, this was interesting also. She was a doctor, uh, a gynecologist, Jonathan says she was a very impressive lady, quite wonderful, but she had a strange inability to distinguish her gynecological work from the household business. What was he talking about? Um, um, well, um, uh, we were usually regaled at mealtimes with um, descriptions of operations, and there was often a coincidence so that the, when the soup came, a nice thick soup, she would be talking about pus. <laughs> um, and vice versa, that when, when she operated, she would talk to her residents about cooking, and when pus came up, there was the soup. And she seemed to have no sense that, that this wasn't necessarily the best thing you could do at dinner, at dinner time? Um, I, I, I quite liked the combination. I, I, and there were some other things. I, um, you know, at that time, before mad cow disease, one ate brains, calf brains, and my mother, who was also an anatomist, would slice them carefully and give me a slice, she said, cerebellum. <laughs> um, 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 uh, uh, dentate nucleus. Uh, that, that was a very special one. And so um, I, I partly learned my cerebral anatomy at the dinner table. Now, uh, when you uh, go to high school and then you graduate and before you go to college, this is what Jonathan says. He says, you know, I said to him, like, what were you, at, or rather, this is Ren Weschler did a lot of these interviews. He said, what were you um, hoping for at 17? He said, well, I think, this is Jonathan, he said, I think we were, we were all of us great admirers of the great encyclopediatic Victorian comparative anatomists. He said, just try saying this name to Oliver and see what happens. This is uh, Jonathan talking to Ren. Ray Lancaster. Oh, yes. He, he was a wonderful zoologist and um, the first to describe a freshwater jellyfish, which he found in an aquarium. But he also went with a famous um, pioneering expedition uh, which roamed the seas and found th thousands of new species. Uh, Ray Lancaster is also the original, probably, of Conan Doyle's Professor Challenger. Really? Yeah. So there you are, 17, and these are here are the other names. You said Balfour and Bride, Goodrich. Do these names mean anything to you? Yeah. Yeah. So you weren't like rooting for the people on the soccer team. You weren't thinking about boxing. You were thinking about Ray Lancaster. And according to Jonathan, what you all wanted to grow up to be was adventurers, scholars, and omniscient. Uh, and in particular, Victorian naturalists. Well, so then you go to America, and uh, and when did you go to the United States? After you go, you finish Oxford, you then you finish uh, medical school. Yeah. So when, when are I, we now? And then I did some internships. The last one was in Birmingham, and in the summer of 1960, in July of 60, around my birthday, I fled the coop. Why? Um, I. Uh, I think I'd had a romantic feeling for the, the West, the American and Canadian West. I liked cowboy films. I liked paintings of the West of Yosemite, Albert Bierstadt, and so forth. Wait a second, wait a um, second. In I, the I, last I, sentence, you were talking about I, how you wanted to be a Victorian zoologist, and now the cowboys are in here too? Uh, they too, and, um, and Ans Ansel Adams. I sort of, um, one of my hobbies was landscape photography, and, and I, I wanted the landscape of... But I also felt that uh, um, I was surrounded, as you can imagine, by, by innumerable cousins, to say nothing of immediate family. I wanted to get away. Um, my eldest brother had gone to Australia 
also when he was just 27. And I fled first to Canada and then to California. And is fleeing the right word? Like, did you t say to your parents, next year I will go to Canada, or how did you? Um, no, I, they thought I was just uh, going to Canada for a short holiday, but I sent a, a rather cruel telegram uh, from Montreal saying, stain. One word. One word. <laughs> wow. Uh, Jonathan says, in this period, from 1959 or so to 1966 or so, he said, a sort of blackness descends on Oliver. And uh, uh, he said he wanted to become a, a doctor, a writer, both. Um, and, and then Tom Gunn, I guess, is going to frame this next period. This is a, what he thought is the riddle of you. Now, this is interesting. Tom Gunn is, t explain who Tom Gunn is, first of all. Um, uh, Tom Gunn, uh, who died a few years ago, was, uh, was a, a very good poet who was born in England and uh, uh, also came to the States in his mid-twenties. And um, uh, I originally learned of his poetry from Jonathan. Jonathan said, read The Sense of Movement, book of poems. And I read that in another earlier book called Fighting Terms. And uh, I loved these tough poems which, um, which had all the learning of, of Spencer, of 16th century English poetry, but was set in, um, in urban San Francisco, and often a slightly violent urban San Francisco. He says that the Oliver I knew when I met him, when he was new in America, was the last person you would have imagined to be able to write awakenings. And precisely his trouble was, at that time, he couldn't sympathize with people enough. It wasn't that he was lacking kindness. He was lacking a kind of sympathetic imagination. He was sort of stuck on himself had a little, and the inability to get beyond himself. Ten years later, the change was completely profound because look at what he is now, both in his conduct, his talk, his life, his writing. That's a change greater than almost anyone I know. What happened, he asks. I don't know. Now he, he's going to list some possibilities. Uh, yeah, um, uh, Tom said um, uh, this transformation, uh, did it come about because you got into analysis or because you fell in love or because you took drugs or, or was it just a maturation which occurred? And I was obsessed by these questions. I finally wrote back and said all of the above. <laughs> Well, let's do, because I, I wrote my own list. I said, well, so was it, the, he said acid, drugs, uh, maybe exhausting himself from all manner of extreme behaviors, uh, just getting older, getting over cleverness, which is what you guess you get in college, become too clever, getting free away from your family, forgiving yourself, or maybe shifting your concentration from yourself to your patients. So let me just go through some of these. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry that that was... Another one of, yeah. of, of Thomas, or was it your patience? So uh, motorcycling. Uh, first, uh, what's with mo You don't. Could, do we have some early motorcycle pictures? I think it would be uh, number seven. Yeah. Yeah. That's you. I guess so. We have another. I guess oh, so. This, now, this is like really buff. Where are you here? <laughs> um, uh, this was in '61. My. Uh, previous bike had blown up in Alabama, and I got a, a new bike, a BMW, in New York. So this is New York. That's your New York one. Do we have another? That's you, uh, um, look that's probably a, in California somewhere. Right, yeah. So, so um, Jonathan says uh, he has the record for speeding tickets on motorcycles in California, 122 miles per hour coming off the Golden Gate Bridge. Is that um, true or false? Um, I, I think that's a slight exaggeration. Um, um, I, uh, I, I'm an exaggerator myself, but even so, I think when, I don't think the bike I had then would have gone much more than about <laughs> 105. Though I, 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 I liked being flat on the saddle and, and, and taking. What do you mean by flat on the saddle? Uh, well, to reduce wind, wind resistance. You mean you lie on your stomach? On sorry, the yes. On the, on the bike at that speed? On the tank, yes. Where would your, would your neck, would your head 
forward, uh, I'm uh, assuming. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of more or less on the handlebars. How long could you lie flat on your stomach going at 100 miles oh, an hour? Oh, a long while, because in my Los Angeles days, I would take off after work on Friday and, and go to see if I could make the Grand Canyon by dawn. And that's, that's 900 miles. It's a, f it's a fairly straight, but you, you have to keep going pretty fast. And I, and, and I loved looking down and seeing the road sucked under the, the front wheel. And um, uh, there was sort of strange illusions. But you, you, you worked the day. You'd gotten in at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning in, on Friday. It's 5 p.m., 6 p.m., whatever. Yeah, usually a bit early, about 4. Yeah. 4. And you're going to go at 100 miles an hour on a straight line to the Grand Canyon to get there by dawn? Is that the plan? Yes. <laughs> Did you ever fall asleep? Uh, no, I never fell asleep. Huh. Um, although Did you ever I, get to the Grand Canyon? I, I um, usually got close to the Grand Canyon. If not, sometimes I was before dawn, sometimes afterwards. Sometimes I would go to other canyons like Oak Creek Canyon uh, or Sedona. I, I, I adored Californian landscape and, in fact, uh, subscribed to a magazine called Arizona Highways for 40 years. <laughs> Uh, here's a poem that I was given. The road, or I don't know what this is, prose, something nice. The road is straight and white, my shadow gesturing sweeps before me. I sing aloud in the brilliant sun, but the wind steals my sound before I can hear it. I sit up in state upon my saddle. I lie flat and hug the bulbous tank. I swerve insanely to and fro. The bike swings easily with my hips, translating feeling into motion. So this is kind of erotic, kind of crazy, yeah. kind of... Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little embarrassed that that, that fragment has turned up, but um, 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 usually my writing is somewhat less lyrical and more <laughs> measured. But, uh, but what, 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 what the hell? <laughs> what, did, what did you call yourself uh, as when you were... When people said hello, did you call yourself doctor? Um, or? Um, no, well, I... Um, I mentioned my grandfather was Oliver Wolf, and when I went to California, I decided I wanted to renounce, as it were, the, the soft Oliver identity and take on a tough vulpine wolf identity. And so, so that's wolf? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I wasn't terribly good as a wolf. I was too <laughs> good-natured. But you did, you did do weird stuff. So one time you had a patient who was blind, paralyzed, dying, but who had a kind of private wish. She, she wanted to go up a California canyon on a, mo on a motorcycle. Yeah. Uh, um, I lived in Topanga Canyon then. She had a rare uh, disease called, called Devick's disease, uh, which can cause blindness and spinal cord damage, but she was completely intact up here, but she, she knew she was dying, and as a sort of last wish, uh, she said she wanted to come with me up and down Topanga Canyon on the motorbike. And um, I thought about it a bit, not much. I, I decided, yes, I think we can do this. And at that time, I had some very massive weightlifting buddies from Muscle Beach Gym. And one <laughs> Sunday morning, we um, came in and quietly abducted her. Quietly? Yes. When um, three uh, uh, large men <laughs> and a doctor wearing leather yeah. abduct a patient out, yeah. I assume the front, do you take out the back door or the front um, door? No, the front door. Front I, door. I, I, I assured everybody that it was OK. <laughs> and um, Well, how did she, would you, how uh, would she get on the bike? Like, she was lifted onto the bike and strapped to me strapped to you? Yes. Did you then go up the canyon um, road? I, I did indeed. Um, somewhat more slowly and carefully than usual, um, because I wasn't used to a, you know, that sort of weight. But I... And I this is Eskimo style. She's like, li she's like a, a, a papoose. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yes. Um, or, or is she enjoying this? or uh, She seems to be enjoying it very much. <laughs> seems um, to be. Yeah. And um, when... When we brought her back, I thought I was going to be fired on the spot, <laughs> I, I, if not taken into custody. <laughs> um, but, um, but somehow or other people, um, the university, the neurology department had, had got used to some, uh, they call them eccentricities. <laughs> and, um, and it was okay. 
Um, and I, there was an odd relation with, to the neurology department because on the one hand, I was an embarrassment to them, but on the other hand, I was the only one who could publish papers in the literature. Mm -hmm. So I, I, was a, I was an ornament at the same time. So you were an I, ornament I that was allowed to, or, to, to, to get his own ornament for one canyon ride in the case yeah. of, a, of a patient. Right. Uh, did this going fast, hundreds of miles in the night and abducting patients, did it, um, did it solve anything or was it just because you were young or like, just to go back to Tom Gunn's notion, is there anything going, are you, are you learning anything when you go this fast? Um, no, I, it's, uh, I think I found it thrilling. I like the sensation. Um, the um, uh, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, who was a great horseman in the Middle East, then rode motorbikes in England and, and, and said that- And a, died. A, and, mm -hmm. and said that a skittish motorbike with a touch of blood in it was better than all the riding animals on earth. Mm -hmm. And as you say, he died. And I had a few, um, a few mishaps myself. And somehow the, I think, People like me are called risk prone. <laughs> uh, not risk prone, it's the opposite of risk averse. Yes, risk, riscophil riscophilia. Uh, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, if the, the, so we'll move from compulsive write, writing to compulsive writing. Uh, you're writing a journal during this period. You are writing a lot, I guess. Well, I, I, when I came to America, which was impulsive, as going to Canada was, I didn't have a green card. I had to wait something like three months for it. And then I took off and zigzagged around the States. Although there was a part where, as I say, the bike blew up in Alabama and I had the to The bike get... blew up in Alabama? Uh, yes, the, um, uh, my first bike was a, a second-hand bike. Uh, this is going to sound rather technical. It was a BMW bike called an R69, which was a high compression machine, but the man who sold it to me had put low compression pistons in it from an R60, and these things finally collapsed and seized up under the strain, but I was able to get a lift uh, for myself and the carcass <laughs> in, in of Alabama. The bike. Yeah, we, we spent several days at a truck stop called Travel Happy, <laughs> and then I... Um, I hitched, the, we went to Indianapolis, then I hitched to New York and got the new bike. Writing all the while? Um, I am um, certainly, I, I kept a journal, Travel Happy, which um, uh, really for three days and nights, and that's one of the very few early things of mine which has been published. You, um, you also wrote to Frank Kermode about a, a book that caught your eye. The title was? The Genesis of Silence. Yeah. Well, well, I, I didn't actually get past the title. Um, I, I, I wrote two or three pages. Thinking, how long was your, how long, you said you, you wrote a 20,000 word letter I to did. Frank about his title. Oh. Well, uh, perhaps that was a little much. A little much. <laughs> <laughs> um, now we'll go to drugs from, <laughs> Jonathan Miller, I, this is like, I, I'm just going to read this sentence and I don't even know what to think about it. At this point, he's already become sort of extravagantly eccentric and experimental with himself, taking drugs, fixing himself blood milkshakes with half-finished transfusions, frying placentas. He stopped at nothing. He was just experimenting with himself. Frying placentas. Uh, I, know, I don't recommend them. No. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're a bit like spleen. They're a bit like spleen. Yeah. Well, so so this was this was back to the 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 well. Eric calls this an uncontrollable orality. He says that at one point he got 200 milligrams of LSD. Didn't know it was so new they didn't quite know what to do with it. So he just cut uh, 50 units each, left 100 on the table, went off to the bathroom or something. When he came back. Oliver had gulped the remaining 100 grams. He was greedy like that. It was an uncontrollable orality. Okay. Now, did, what, what, what uh, were you well, doing? Well, first, first it was micrograms. Oh, micrograms. Yes. 
Well, I'm that's a, good. Right. <laughs> um, I, 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 200 milligrams would more than suffice for everyone here. <laughs> yes. w uh, so this phrase, uncontrollable orality, were you, were you aware of what you were doing, or were you just like, it was just... Uh, um, sometimes. Um, actually, Jonathan, um, who directs operas, among everything else, uh, incorporated this into one of his... Um, uh, one of his opera versions of Eugene Onegin, and there is a character who, who rather absent-mindedly, oh, sorry, um, that's okay. Uh, um, uh, w without appearing to eat, fi goes round and round the table and sort of removes everything. At one point, he tries to pull a grape off the bunch, and it doesn't come off, so he takes the whole bunch, <laughs> and. Um, but uh, I, I, I do have a tendency that way, and it was similar with my father. Um, uh, we had to keep the refrigerator locked, or he asked us to keep it locked. And um, Locked with a padlock or something? Or, or sort of, yes. Yeah. And um, I had a little party on Friday, and a great deal has been left over, and I've had to ask people to take it away while they have the chance. So one day you just looked, I mean, one day actually you did look in the mirror and said, Oliver, you are, or Wolf, or whatever you're calling yourself, yes. uh, you are going to, this cannot go on. Or so what happened? Yeah. Well, that was on the last day on, on New Year's Eve in 1966. I had been hitting amphetamine very hard. And far from eating voraciously at that time, amphetamine kills the appetite. I, I looked very gaunt and haggard. And uh, one gets moments of lucidity, and I, I saw my, you know, um, my skull through the skin, and I thought, Oliver, you won't survive another year unless there's intervention. And then I went out and went to the good analyst, whom I still, whom I'm still seeing. In fact, I see really? him tomorrow. How, how long have uh, you? For, for Forty-eight years. You Forty-eight out years. Here. Wow. I, I, I was sort of getting somewhere now. <laughs> <laughs> and you said to yourself, that's it? And did you go cold turkey? Did you stop? Um, no. Um, uh, I never deliberately went cold turkey, but there was an episode about a year later, um, which I describe in Hallucinations, when, um, when the, the, ex the amphetamine ecstasy, and there's a lot of ecstasy if you take two grams, 400 tablets, um, very dangerous. You're, you've got a heart rate of 200. And God knows what your blood pressure is doing. I lost several friends through this sort of folly. I was very lucky to survive. But in that last uh, amphetamine Event. ecstasy, I read a, a 19th century book on migraine. It was called On Megrim, which was the, an old Victorian term. I was enchanted by the book, um, both by the science and by the humanity of the book. Um, uh, I'd been, um, I disliked the rather impoverished technical papers I had been reading. I thought one needed a book like that, but that had been written in the 1860s, now it was the 1960s. I thought, who can write a book like that now? And a sort of disingenuous clutter of names went through my mind followed by a very loud internal voice which said, you, you silly bugger, you're the man. <laughs> and um, and um, I, I Xeroxed the book. I started writing my own book. Um, and I think in some ways that last amphetamine episode opened a door to some, some sort of creativity or whatever. And I never took it again. I never wanted to take it again. I felt I never needed to take it again. Somehow or other, the motor had been kicked into life. Well, let me quickly run through the uh, muscle period, and then we'll go to, back to patience, which is where I want to go. Um, take a look, let's take a look at some of these uh, muscle things. Uh, so that's, look at you. <laughs> How did you, like, that's, that's mostly muscle, isn't it? Uh, well, there's a little bit of muscle there. Yeah. Can we have another? 
That, now what uh, are you doing here? Uh, okay, well I'm not defecating, although it looks like <laughs> that. Um, uh, the, the, my, my favorite lift and the one I was strongest at uh, is called the squat or te deep knee bend. And uh, I got a California record with that, which was 600 pounds. You got a California record? You, yes. You, you are a Muscle Beach record holder? Um, well, I was a Californian record holder, but, well, but it sort of—it served as my introduction in Muscle Beach. You know, just as when you, you know, uh, writing a, a paper may serve as your introduction in academia. Um, and uh, I, uh, well, uh, uh, I can't read that. I hope that's that's yeah. So, um, so I was I was good at that, although I, in retrospect. Um, there were, there were, on Muscle Beach, there were a lot of good Olympic lifters who had been in the Olympic Games. Um, well, this was kind of like a cowboy movie again. This guy, there's a cop named Dave Ashman. Yes. He says to you, hey, I can lift whatever it was. Well, well, well he, he was the heavyweight Olympic champion of the world. He was, uh, so he, he was a gold medalist. And he challenged you? He challenged me to, not to this lift, but to a thing called, called the front squat which is more difficult because you have to balance the bar here. And um, I'd never actually done much in the way of front squatting, but I felt I, I, couldn't, I couldn't reject the challenge. Because then I why, why are you like Wyatt Earp or something? Like uh, why can't you, yeah, if, yeah. Uh, if someone who was a gold medal Olympic yeah, champion yeah. came up to me yeah. and said, I think I can take you. I'd say, take yeah. me, yeah. I wouldn't know. Uh, well, I, 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 was, I, I was afraid I would be seen as a, as a wimp. Ah. Okay, yeah, yeah, there's me on Muscle Beach. Yeah. What, what, is that you there? Um, uh, yeah. That's not you. That's you. No, no that one. Yeah. So um, you, you, when Ashman asked, uh, said to you, I can take you, didn't you, you, what happened? Okay, well, we started with lightweight 200, 300. I got rather frightened when we got up to 500. Can you, Shwan, is there one where his head's popping off? I think it, it uh, um, yeah, oh, look at oh, you. Yeah, yeah th 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 that was actually the record one with 600. The one you saw before that was, I did with slightly more with 625. I, um, I Weren't you worried that you're... Uh... Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I can see I was doing a Valsalva, which is always pushes up blood pressure in the head. But anyhow, then Dave did 550 and to my surprise, I was able to do it for the front squat. And Dave said, enough, quits, went to shake hands with me, and I said, I want 575. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so, did you, pull, did you yes, lift the 575? I, I did 575. Well, did this work for your, I mean, the reason you're doing Muscle Beach, I, I don't even know the reason you're doing the drugs. The reason you're eating is maybe because of inheritance. The reason you're writing furiously is because you're crazy. But the reason for, Weightlifting, I assume, is the usual, uh, I will be strong on the outside and will make me strong and I, I, fierce I, I, on the I, inside. And, and confident. Yes. Uh, but, but, but in fact, despite all this, I, 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 I remained um, um, timid and, and, and cowardly. And, uh, <laughs> and in many ways still am, although in other ways I can be brazen and provocative. So if we, if we go past the bike compulsion, the drug compulsion, the riding compulsion, what about the compulsion to treat patients in, in fairly startlingly uh, new ways? Um, uh, for a long while you told Wen Weschler, uh, one walk you took with him, that maybe you said, I'm afraid I love the natural tissue. I don't really have as much of an appreciation of the social tissue, the kind of thing which, for example, would make New York so interesting. Uh, in other words, I think you were saying to him that you just like plants and rocks more than people, and you weren't going to be a good people person. But look at you. I mean, you've, yeah. you've, uh, um, you've certainly changed. Well, well I, I, I remain a sort of social moron, but there's something very special about physician-patient relationships. They are formal, and, the, and yet they can be intimate. And the formality allows the intimacy and things can be said in this relationship, which is one of, of, of trust. Um, I, I, as Jonathan intimated, I, I was a little unhappy and went from one compulsion, as you call it, to another. Um, I, 
I also, um, I tried to be a bench scientist when I first came to New York and that, that ended in multiple mishaps. So basically they said, get out of the lab, Sachs. You're a menace, go see patients, you'll do less harm. <laughs> um, and, um, but then seeing patients and learning about them and, uh, and caring for them, I think, um, uh, came as a wonderful revelation to me. I'd never really experienced it when I was a student or in residency where you're simply assigned a patient. But now I was a real doctor. I had to be responsible. And, um, and I love that and it transformed me. And probably to go back to Tom Gunn's letter, that was probably the main influence. I want to show you a video if I may, uh, at Beth, this is at Beth Abraham in the Bronx. Uh -huh. You're now a young doc, and there's some people in the back room. It's a very famous situation at this point, but then it was just old people who were sort of, well, let's take a look at, can we, can we just run the video and I'll, it'll sort of speak for itself. That's you, that's me. This for a second, is it possible? Yeah. So now, um, this well, is... Well, um, when I went into the hospital, I was struck by seeing many people standing motionless, sometimes in, in odd postures, but also there were many people in bed and um, often with, with strange movements. And, uh, um, and I learned uh, that these patients who had all had the sleepy sickness or, 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 uh, or encephalitis lethargica, um, really the hospital had been opened for these people in 1919 and 1920, and some of them had been there since then. Um, this was an illness which attracted a huge amount of attention in the early days but um, by 1935 or so, people had either died um, or had become what one physician called extinct volcanoes. So there were, there were these frozen people, 80 of them, whom I encountered at let's, Beth Abraham. Let's, let's, let it look at, let's go a little bit further in. We can yeah. see them quite frozen in a minute. <laughs> the rigidity one. The ones were very rigid. They're, uh, oh, do you not have the rigid ones? Uh, yeah, no. I didn't know how long this was okay. going to go on. The, so, um, uh, here's my question. is: If these people were sort of warehoused for all these years, yeah. um, what did you see that no one else had seen before you? Hope of some I, kind? I saw or thought I saw fleeting animation and expressions but the nurses who really understood these people much better and observed them much more closely said that on some occasions they would come to life. In particular, um, I, sometimes in emergencies, but also sometimes in relation to music. And that people who couldn't talk or walk might sing or dance. And, uh, and would be transformed while the music lasted and the transformation would suddenly stop when the music stopped. 
So you, uh, no one was asking you to look closer. No one was, uh, uh, the thing that gets, that gets me the most, I think, is that I think neuroscience normally measures things. So they'll take your pulse, they'll do various tests. And for some reason, the charts didn't give anybody any information that there was something going on. So you had to go sort of below the charts in some way. Um, no, uh, th there were good charts on some of the patients. Th at that time, there didn't exist the mischievous ruling, which there is now, that uh, a patient's chart has to be kept for five years. I say mischievous, because this is then seen as a license to destroy a chart after five years. Huh. Um, but in fact, in Beth Abraham, there were some very good charts going back which showed, amongst other things, that some of these now frozen patients had been violently hyperactive in the early days before Parkinsonism and catatonia enveloped them. Um, and uh, Where the, did you get the idea that you might give them a chemical, a pill, uh, L-dopa, that might release them from their... Wh where did that idea come from? Right. Um, well, um, in 66, when I went, no medicinal approach, no surgical approach was of any use to such patients. But then early in 67, uh, there were medical reports and newspaper reports of a new drug which could have amazing effects in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, now, these patients had something much more extensive than Parkinson's disease, but Parkinson's, Parkinsonism was, was part of the picture. And I immediately wondered what it, the effects might be. The drug given was, was L, I keep apologizing to inanimate objects. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but you're hurting it too, so yeah, it's a nice right. thing to do. Um, the drug given was, uh, if drug is the right word, L-dopa, which is a precursor of a brain chemical of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. Um, one of the patients, in fact, the, the Leonard L of the book and the film, um, uh, who could speak a bit, heard of this, and he called dopamine resurrectamine. Um, <laughs> so some of these patients who had been hopeless for decades felt that something wonderful might be on the way. For various re reasons, I, I, I was constrained and didn't try L-DOPA for two years. Um, I was constrained partly because one had to have a special license to give it, um, but also I, um, I knew of the violent activities some of the people had had earlier and wondered whether these might return. I also wondered what sort of an existential shock it might be if they did awaken to find themselves in a world which had moved on 40 years or whatever, while perhaps they had not. Um, but, um, but in March of 69, I, I started giving it. Were you frightened? I mean, no one had done this before. You were the first. Did you, uh, did you have someone to go to to say, should I do this? Is this OK? Um, the, um, there had been one paper from, from London published, uh, but with a rather different population. The patients in London, whom I w was often to visit later, were, were much less severely affected. So you um, just didn't know? And um, I, I, I tell you what I'm, I'm kind of curious about. Um, this opens the rest of your life, kind of, because really what you have pioneered is a kind of investigation of different people, Tourette's, colorblind people, uh, autistic people. But really what you seem to do is you, you seem to listen very closely. You somehow ask them to tell you a story and you, you kind of, um, you try to experience whatever they're experiencing from the inside. It's a, it's a very, very deep empathic sort of way of looking. And um, I don't know, to ask once again Tom Gunn's question, 
was it your brother and that crisis at home? Was it pain or something that you had managed to handle? Your, what is it that makes you such a good listener <laughs> and such a curious? Um, you well, know? I, I, was, I was interested. These were people in, in an extraordinary situation, um, far outside ordinary experience. And um, I mean, just as one wants to go to the moon or Antarctica, uh, somewhere, <coughs> somewhere exotic, um, I, I wanted to know how it was for them and where they were, and to try and imagine myself into them. What was the reaction from academic neurologists when these patients came to and then collapsed back into a kind of? Um, well, um, the, I, I wrote a letter to JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1970, indicating that all of these patients had done very well at first and then all of them had run into problems, uh, sometimes very deep and disturbing problems, and that I had been unable, for the most part, to get them on track again. And that I thought uh, the whole notion of, of titrating someone with a drug, just bringing it up to the right amount, was not adequate. Uh, and in fact, it was as if patients split into effects of too muchness and not enoughness and oscillated wildly. Um, my colleagues didn't like my letter, um, and there was a whole issue of JAMA devoted to indignant rebuttals, um, although it became clear that this was partly because they did not have similar patients. They had patients with relatively mild Parkinson's disease, um, which in fact did later, uh, such patients might have trouble later, five or seven years later, whereas my post-encephalitic patients might run into trouble within a week of starting the drug. Um, there was one um, colleague who said that he had treated 162 patients and had never observed anything similar to what I described. I wrote to him saying that 15 of his patients were now under my care at Beth Abraham, <laughs> and would he care to make a visit? But he didn't care. So here's what, here's what your best friends said about this period. Jonathan says, I, someone asked me, well, he's such a, Oliver is such a romantic neurologist. And Jonathan says, yeah, he is a romantic neurologist, which allows him to see things that these reductionists, these break it down to the data, people don't see, he, he just thinks and lives larger. And even if he romanticizes and sometimes exaggerates on occasions, even his fictions become luminous truths in his own right. He says, look, here's the deal. He appeals to some aspect of neurology that modern neuroductionist science has not yet accommodated. He treats people as a kind of curious infinity that exists in each individual. And that just doesn't come out in ordinary neurology. Um, but Eric, your other best friend, says, you know what, though, I mean, that's all true, but he doesn't like to make measurements of anything. His constant emphasis on immeasurable, imponderable, intangible, I mean, yes, his, his critics are a Stone Age ignorant Philistines who refuse to accept anything that could be well-written and reliable. They just can't imagine, the, okay, it's beautifully written, but where's the datum? She says, why doesn't Oliver give them a little data? What's your response to Eric? Um, well, there's no shortage of data. And um, when I got my license from the Drug Enforcement, uh, the DEA, um, to give L-DOPA, I had to promise to, to um, make various measurements and fill out a protocol. I did do that. Uh, but at the same time, I felt it was quite inadequate. And I, um, uh, additionally, I complemented that, if you want, by, by my own somewhat narrative and maybe even somewhat novelistic descriptions. Um, novelistic not in the way of, uh, of inventing characters, but in terms of, of drama and crisis and feeling. 
Let, let me, I suddenly look at my watch and I've, 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 uh, I'm sorry. It's uh, a little la longer than I thought it was, I had done. So let me just jump one last step here. Um, this, um, there is a, a Russian neuroscientist named Luria, V.S. Luria, and I'm just gonna finish with him. I, I think, um, huh. you write Luria, and you say like, at one point you say, like, let me see here. Once when I was obsessing on some problem, I sent Luria a 500 word telegram, which cost me $200. <laughs> and I said to him, was this all right? I mean, was such and such an approach okay? I mean, if I, what if I do it another way? Was it acceptable? And I received a blessed two word reply, do it, signed A.R. <laughs> Luria. Right. This is the guy who seems to be your doppelganger. Yeah. Um, the, well, he was certainly, in a way, my, my mentor. Um, but yeah, we have a picture of him. Uh, we have a, I think, yeah, go ahead. L if you find a Luria, there he is. Yeah. Yeah. And, he, um, and his letters were physically very beautiful. They were always written with a... We, have, a, we, have, a, we have his letters, too, because the, there's lots yeah. of nice looking. Um, um, well, I, I had greatly admired Luria as a medical student. He once came to London and gave a talk about some twins he had observed in, in the, mis, the miscarriages of language which occurred in their development. And I was struck by the mixture of, or by the conjunction of uh, great precision with obvious feeling and affection. And uh, then in 1968, I read a book of his which had been published called The Mind of a Nemonist. A nemonist is someone with a, a remarkable memory. memory. In fact, Luria's nemonist had an infinite memory and was also unable to forget anything. But I read the first 20 pages of this thinking it was a novel. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that it was a case history, but the most beautiful and detailed uh, I'd ever seen, but with the sensibility of a I don't know, a, a Turgenev behind it. Um, in 73, um, when Awakenings came out, um, uh, Richard Gregory, a, a scientist in England, and, and as it happens, a friend of Luria's, reviewed it. But I also reviewed or wrote an essay review on Luria in the same journal. And two weeks later, I got two letters from Luria. One about my article in which with great courtesy and charm, he made clear that I had got it wrong, <laughs> and I got him wrong in various ways, but that he was very pleased with the attention. And then he wrote me a, a lovely letter about awakenings in which he said, um, uh, he said the art of observation and tradition, uh, the art of observation and description, he said, which one saw in the great neurologists and psychiatrists of the 19th century, that tradition is lost now, or is almost lost, and he said, but you have revived it. And um, that, in a way, defined my identity and and also resonated with the boyhood notion uh, of being a 19th century naturalist, although one with the data of the 20th and of course now the 21st century at his command. Well, you've just solved my how do I end this problem. <laughs> That's the end. Oh, not quite. Actually, um, the people here uh, wanted to give you something because this is like the last thing in the whole sequence. So there is a, um, they have a final, I think Bill T. Jones has a gift for you. Haley will help present it. It's just the last, you know, you have to do that like you. Oh. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Thank you all very much for being here. Would you please join us out in the lobby for some cake and some good times. Thank you all much for a great week. <laughs>